Hi everyone, my name is Ethan and I'm going to be talking with you about behavioral predictors and effects of parasites on colony initiation in bumblebees. Uh, here on the left you can see a bumblebee species. It's a huntii, one of the, one of the common species around Miami. Um, so bumblebees are an example of a social insect. Social insects are cooperative organisms that include bees, ants, wasps, and termites. Um, once a colony is fully grown, they can have complex interactions with their environment and with each other, but in order to reach full growth, you, they first have to develop. And so here we're going to be talking about one stage of the nest initiation process, and that is the founding stage, right? And so there's different types of founding, there's swar and there's two main types, swarming and independent founding. Here, we're just going to talk about the independent founding. Um, independent founding is done by some ants, bumblebees, wasps, and um, some other bee species. Um, and it is quite difficult. There's very high rates of failure, and it is very resource dependent on the new queen, right? The new queen is responsible for laying eggs, is responsible for foraging, is responsible for protection. Um, and queens with workers and colonies, the in fully grown colonies, the queens don't have to worry about that. The queens have the workers to forage for them and to protect their young. Um, but if a queen is finding founding their colony independently, they don't. It's all up to them. Um, and so bumblebees do this. And independent founding often has very low success rates. And so this is a graph where the red bars indicate oviposition, which is just egg laying. So oviposition failure and the green bars represent oviposition success across five different groups of organisms. Um, the first is P. badius, which is an ant species. Um, these next two groups are wasps. Polis species is a genus of wasp. V. analis is a species of wasp. And then the next two are bumblebee, Bombus huntii, and Bombus volsensky. Um, and as you can see from here, bumblebees are relatively better than the other species of insects, but they still fail 50% of the time. And they fail quite often, even in laboratory conditions. Um, and so the question is kind of why do they fail this often? And um, one thing we need to think about with this is parasites. And if we're thinking about parasites, we need to be thinking about um, bumblebee decline. And so bumblebees are recently have been declining as a result of parasite and pathogen spillover from honeybee colonies. Um, so this, these are some honeybee colonies. And so if these honeybee colonies get infected with parasites and they're moved across the country or across continents, the parasites will move with them. And so then when the honeybees forage on flowers, they also they will come in contact with bumblebees, the local bumblebee populations that are also foraging on the flowers. They'll spread parasites between the two and that will result in colonies of bumblebees becoming infested with parasites. Um, and so the question is, how do parasites, or I'm sorry, how do bumblebees respond to parasites in the nest initiation phase? Um, and so to continue talking about that, we need to first discuss the different types of parasites that could potentially be effect, infecting the queens around Laramie, right? And so there's kind of um, three main ones. There's nematodes, which can be quite varied. Some can be, some are benign, some are very um, devastating on queens. And then there's also nosema and crithidia, which are two examples of microparasites. Um, and they're somewhat similar um, at low levels of infection. They can be quite benign and not very impactful. Uh, but when they reach high levels of infection, they can lead to colony collapse and worker death and queen death um, and are generally not good for colonies to be infected with. Um, and so what we did was we collected wild queens around Laramie this past spring. We collected five species, uh, Bombus huntii, Bombus grizzly colis, Bombus nevidensis, Bombus appositus, and occidentalis. And these are all uh, Bombus species, which is the genus. And so we placed the queens in temperature and humidity controlled colony boxes in the dark. And then we evaluated their behavior and nest status about every two to three days um, when we fed them. And so we considered for the purposes of this, we considered oviposition as indicative of successful nest initiation. And so here on the right, you can see a huntii species, or um, you can see a huntii individual, um, with her eggs, we give them all pollen um, balls uh, because to, to, we give them all pollen balls initially so they can feed on them and so they can lay their eggs on them. And so here on the side, you can see that she laid her eggs on a pollen ball and she probably has some eggs underneath her as well. And so this queen would be one that was successful in nest initiation. Um, and so while we, were, while we were observing these queens and working with them, we noticed that there were certain behaviors um, that some some queens showed and some queens didn't, um, right? So some queens, when we fed them, they became very disturbed and would try to escape from their colony boxes and other queens didn't and they were just kind of used to us or they just didn't respond to us. Um, and so we developed four main uh, behaviors that we'd observed. The first is attempting escape and this is a nevidensis queen. And you can see she's up against the glass, she's beating her wings, um, right? She's trying to escape from her um, little habitat. 
and then the another one is pacing. And so here is a anti queen, and she is just kind of pacing around. She's not she's not trying to escape, but she's certainly moving. Um, and then the other two behaviors are the still behaviors, which is just they're just sitting there, or the feeding behaviors, which is where they're feeding on pollen or feeding on nectar. And so we from this we want to ask three questions. Um, first, did nest initiation success vary among the five species that we collected? Secondly, what queen behaviors predict nest initiation success? And thirdly, did parasite presence reduce nest initiation success? Um, so the first question, does nest initiation success vary among species? Um, so this graph is similar to the one before. The red bars represent oviposition failure, the green bars represent oviposition success, and these numbers represent the percent that succeeded in oviposition. Um, and what's notable here is um, the rate that Bombus huntii and Bombus occidentalis. So Bombus huntii was by far the most abundant species in Laramie, and Bombus occidentalis was easily the least abundant um, in Laramie. We caught six occidentalis queens, and we caught um, 330 huntii queens, about. And so Bombus occidentalis queens are facing declining populations in the West. Currently, they're facing declining populations in Alaska, and it's likely that they're also facing declining populations here. Um, so it's notable that they have such high rates of nest initiation success in the lab. Um, but back to this question, did nest initiation success vary among species? Yes, it did. And now we can go to the next question, what queen behaviors predict nest initiation success? And so the first one we can look at is this attempting escape behavior. Um, so this graph shows um, queens that were successful on top in green and queens that were unsuccessful on the bottom in red. And the x-axis is the proportion of observations when they were attempting escape. So the far right is um, they were attempting escape every time, and the far left is they were never attempting escape when we observed them. Um, and as you can see from here, there's no real trend um, in this. So we can say that no, attempting escape was not predictive of nest initiation success. Um, and then we can ask this exact same question with queens who are still and we find the exact same answer. There's no real trend. So no, it did not. And so then we can look at um, the four behaviors that we observed, attempting escape, still, pacing, and feeding, and none of the behaviors had any relation with nest initiation success. Um, so then we can go into this third question, did parasite presence reduce nest initiation success? And so here is a bumblebee abdomen that is infect infected with microparasites, these little rods, and nematodes. Right, um, and so <clears throat> we've only dissected about 100 to 100 TI so far. And from that, we've determined that about 5% have microparasites and about 50% have nematodes, um, which is quite substantial. Um, most other studies with nematodes have very low, like around 5%, same, similar to microparasite levels. Um, so it's notable that the population around Laramie seems to have higher rates of nematode infestation than others. Um, so what we did, was this is a graph similar to the one before. Red represents oval position failure, green represents oval position success. And it's divided into three groups, um, no nematodes, low prevalence of nematodes, and a high prevalence of nematodes. Um, and, and here on the right, you can see a queen that is infested with nematodes, and you can see some nematode eggs here. Um, but ultimately, there was no difference in um, oval position success or failure based on parasite presence, based on nematode presence. Um, and this, and we'll, we'll, we will continue to um, dissect queens and see if anything changes. But at this, we have dissected almost 80. Um, and it seems unlikely that it does impact nest initiation success. Um, so then we can ask, well, why are our behaviors not useful as predictors? And there's kind of two options here. The first is that there is a pattern, but we just haven't found the pattern yet. Um, so before we were looking at their behavior at every single time before oviposition, uh, but it could be something more, um, it could be something different than that. It could be something along the lines of the behavior in the first three days of that we captured them or the behaviors three days prior to oviposition could be indicative, um, but not the behavior across the whole time. Or it could just be simply that the behaviors we observed are not relevant to oviposition, um, but we, we need to analyze the data a little bit more before we can determine between the two. And then so the next question is, why do we see no impact in nest initiation from parasites? Um, and I think that it's just because the nematode we found is it's not very impactful. Um, so if we take this graph, which again is high prevalence, low prevalence, and no nematodes, and um, the y-axis is the 
days that they survived for in captivity. So 90, they survived for 90 days in captivity, 30, they survived for 30 days in captivity. Um, and you would expect that nematodes, or that if the nematodes were impactful, you'd expect them to, uh, the queens infected with them to die quicker, and you don't see that. So I think that the nematodes are just not very impactful on um, these bumblebees. And so in conclusion, the nest initiation process in wild bees is still not well understood, um, but this hopefully will provide a better understanding of the factors that affect colony initiation, and hopefully will inform our understanding of the wild populations. Um, and here is a picture of a bee that's flying up to a flower. Thank you.